Just to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Live news primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight on primetime, a mysterious letter left at Ahmaud Arbery's memorial after he was shot and killed, reading, I should have stopped them. Now investigators say they know who wrote it. The number of people filing unemployment claims slowing down, but we spoke to some still waiting on their benefits weeks after filing a claim. And with kids spending more time online right now, a tech safety company has a warning for parents about the number of online predators. But first on this Thursday night, a look at the airborne salute to Georgia's health care workers taking it up top, courtesy of Dobbins Air Reserve Base, the 94th Airlift Wing, is flying over hospitals in North Georgia from Marietta to Dalton and back down to Hiram. The trip is to honor those nurses, doctors, and others who are devoting countless hours to caring for Georgians with COVID-19. Our Hope Ford was there, and she will have a live report coming up on 11 Alive News Prime Time at 9. We want to see your videos and photos of the flyover. Just text them to us. 404-885-7600. Be sure to include your name and where you are from. Now to a tragic discovery. A high school senior killed just days before graduation, along with her older stepsister. It is still a mystery what exactly happened more than 24 hours after their bodies were found under an overpass near Rome. But tonight, the GBI is calling this a homicide after completing autopsies on both. Here's 11 Alive's Latasha Givens. GBI agents are in the beginning stages of this double death investigation, but they need the public's help to find out how the sisters died and why. Something a family friend say they need for closure. She was like my sister. Mm -hmm. um, I've known her ever since I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. And she was a loving, caring person. Mm -hmm. And I'm just heartbroken. Kayla Dotson is mourning the tragic death of her friend, 31 year old Trevina Campbell. She says their mothers were best friends who lived in the same apartment complex as they grew up. We spoke with Dotson as she waited with the family outside the police station Thursday. Campbell and her younger stepsister's bodies were discovered Wednesday underneath an overpass near Rome. The Floyd County School District says 19 year old Vanita Vera Richardson was supposed to graduate high school next Saturday. When you found out it was her, what went through your mind? Oh, I was all in tears. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't sleep hardly because me and her is really, really close. In a statement, Floyd County School says Vanita will be remembered for a fun, loving, humble and motivated student who was making strong plans for her future. Even throughout the school closures, Vanita's passing is felt by all, in particular, the staff members whose lives she touched with her caring personality and big heart. Dodson says losing two loved ones at the same time has been difficult for the family. Sure. They're really upset. Um, 
It's just a very, very hard time for them. And for the Rome community as well. Everybody's really sad and um, they're just mulling over her death because she was well known in Rome. GBI is leading this investigation and haven't released details about the manner in which the bodies were found, a motive, or if they have any leads in this case. But investigators do need your help. In a tweet, officials asked anyone traveling in the area between Tuesday around 10 p.m. and Wednesday at 11 a.m. who possibly saw something suspicious to call police. Don't rush to judgment. That is the message that we are getting tonight from the legal team representing one of the men charged with murdering Ahmad Aubrey. The 25 year old was jogging in Brunswick in February, and that's when police say he was chased down by a white father and son who shot and killed him. For months, the men remained free, but last week, a video surfaced showing the confrontation. It sparked nationwide outrage and led to the GBI taking over the case. Soon after that, the father and son were charged with murder. Our Joe Kinky uh, spoke with the attorneys for the son, Travis McMichael. It's the first time we've heard from their lawyers. Travis and Gregory McMichael have spent one week in jail and both now have defense teams working on their cases. Travis McMichael is being defended by Decatur attorneys Robert Rubin and Jason Sheffield. No matter how you look at this case, a young man has died. And that is always a tragedy. Prosecutors say this cell phone video captures an unarmed Ahmad Arbery as he jogged through a Brunswick neighborhood in February before allegedly being confronted by the McMichaels and shot by Travis. We will be presenting our evidence in a court of law. McMichaels attorneys today not discussing specifics of the case as they complete an independent investigation. We are asking everybody who's following this case, who is reading about it, who's reading about it piecemeal, who is who are forming opinions without knowing all the facts to just take a breath. Rubin's past trials include defending an Atlanta public schools principal in the seven month long APS cheating scandal trial. And here Rubin is shaking hands with Hemi Newman, whom he defended during the 2012 Dunwoody daycare murder trial with Newman being found guilty. Travis's father, Gregory, now represented by Macon attorneys Franklin and Laura Hogue. The husband and wife team releasing a statement reading in part, while the death of Ahmad Arbery is a tragedy causing deep grief to his family, a tragedy that at a first appears to many to fit into a terrible pattern in American life, this case does not fit that pattern. The full story to be revealed in time will tell the truth about this case. Franklin Hoag's past cases include representing Stephen McDaniel in 2011, who pleaded guilty to murdering and dismembering Mercer University Law School graduate Lauren Giddings. Lauren Hoag previously served as president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. A mysterious letter left at Arbery's memorial has now raised questions. Investigators say they do know who left it. The letter reads, I am so sorry I should have stopped them and made people wonder if another person could be involved in this case that we simply do not know about. But today, the GBI dispelled any rumors about that. Investigators say they have figured out who left the note. They are not connected to the case in any way. The person is simply expressing their condolences. Tomorrow on Dr. Phil, Ahmad Arbery's mother, we'll talk about her son's murder. It's a feeling that I would never put on another mother. Three o'clock on 11 Alive, Dr. Phil goes deeper into the case, including focusing on the man who taped the video that sparked national outrage. Three o'clock on our sister station, 11 Alive. Let's take a look at some other stories tonight. A woman is behind bars accused of firing shots inside a car, striking her baby's father and his girlfriend. It happened late last night at the Fieldcrest Walk Apartments in Covington. Police say Delana Bailey got into an argument with Deshaun Grayson and his girlfriend, Lapisha Nash, and she tried to drive off. Bailey then allegedly fired shots at the car, hitting them both. They're both in critical condition. According to police, Bailey's 11 month old child was there when this happened, but is okay. Bailey was arrested today in DeKalb County. Gwinnett County Police say a missing father and his daughter from Snellville have now been found. They say William Smith and his four-year-old daughter Brooklyn were located in Byron County, Georgia, but the pair are heading home. The two were noticed missing when Smith, who suffers from a medical condition, wasn't home when his wife returned. Again, both have now been found. Zoo Atlanta will officially reopen to the public this Saturday at 10 a.m., but with a few changes. Starting today, guests will only be able to buy tickets online. All buildings and indoor experiences will remain closed except for the bathrooms. Masks for visitors are not required, but are strongly encouraged.
So each day we're getting emails from you asking us to really break down the coronavirus numbers to give you a better sense of what we're really seeing right now where we stand tonight. We're taking a closer look at a couple of counties tonight, kicking it off with Fulton. Each bar that you see at the bottom represents a single day of new cases. We are focused on this area in the red zone that you see here. That's what we really want to take a look at tonight, indicating when we started reopening Georgia. Overall cases seem to be leveling off in Fulton County after a big spike happened on May 6. We're going to be keeping a close eye on that one. But in Cobb County, we're seeing a similar trend with cases holding steady since May 6 and not really improving or declining overall. But in Clayton County, we were seeing a bit of a decline since about May 6. If you have a question about the numbers, please go ahead and let us know. You can text us at 404-885-7600. And remember, please text. Do not call. American workers continue to struggle, losing jobs or having hours cut back. Total jobless claims in the United States last week were lower than in the past, but still higher than some expected. 2.9 million Americans filed for first time claims. And even though claims peaked in mid March, it is still the eighth straight week of unemployment claims in the millions of people. We won't know until next week what the state's current unemployment rate is, but here's what we do know. Nearly a quarter million new unemployment claims were submitted just last week. The state has paid record amounts to people out of work, yet there are still people still uh, waiting for their unemployment benefits. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into it. Because many businesses can't operate fully or at all because of the pandemic, they're laying off and furloughing workers in record numbers. The food service industry is the top industry that's costing people jobs. Restaurants and related industries slowed down or closed in droves over the last two months. And so it was kind of just a situation where they had to give everyone unemployment since there was nothing that we could really do. In Georgia, new claims for unemployment keep coming in each week. They peaked April 4th, then slowly dropped. In mid-April, they started leveling out, fluctuating in the quarter million range each successive week. The state Labor Department has issued payments to 575,000 unemployed Georgians since the middle of March, more than the previous four years combined. Some of those claims came from the auto sales industry, which has slowed down as well. Brian Butcher filed his claim following a furlough more than a month ago, but got no response. What was frustrating is all my coworkers got their benefits starting the week after we were furloughed up until last week. And I got nothing. Labor Commissioner Mark Butler says newly installed technology plus some human error has slowed down some unemployment claims. And they will most likely be approved as long as they can prove their situation. After we talked with Brian Butcher, we sent his complaint to the Department of Labor and we learned early this afternoon that it got fixed. A small victory in a sweeping story of economic hardship. A warning for parents as kids stay home from school. A tech safety company says it is reporting more online predators. What you can do to protect your kids coming up next on Prime Time. The sun sets in about 20 minutes, and we didn't see a whole lot of the sunshine this morning. As temperatures were at 62 degrees for about five hours. The sun came out this afternoon. We got to the 80s for highs. Nine days for highs are possible down the road. I'll let you know just how hot this weekend is looking. That's coming up. And stay true to our channel for facts, not fear. And as spunky young anchor is entering the Atlanta news scene, you won't want to miss his special report on COVID-19 after the break. For granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. statistic that will certainly get a parent's attention. It comes from a tech safety company in Atlanta called Bark. It says 23% increase it has seen in the number of online predators that this company has had to report to law enforcement just since the quarantine started. Caitlin Ross talked to the chief parenting officer who says it's something every parent needs to watch very closely. It's heartbreaking and disgusting and terrifying. Um, and we hope all parents, you know, and caregivers listen. Bark Chief Parenting Officer Tatanya Jordan says as soon as your children are old enough to use technology, they're old enough to hear about dangerous people who might try to talk to them online. You, you have to talk about these things because it absolutely can happen to your child. She says they knew there would be a rise in online predator activity when they realized how long kids would be stuck at home. But they didn't think it would be this big of an increase. Their data is supported by a recent alert by the FBI warning parents to be vigilant about screen time. Their schedules are off. They don't all have to be up and on a bus, you know, by 6 a.m. Bark uses technology to monitor messages sent to kids' devices. And Jordan says they're watching predators take advantage of the uncertainty during COVID-19. Predators know that children are anxious. They miss their friends. They are lonely. She says online predators also know that some families are struggling financially right now. A lot of games require upgrades and coins and that sort of thing. And if the economy being what it is and things are tight, that could be another tactic they use to send financial gifts and coins for upgrades. But she says that doesn't mean your kids have to be vulnerable. We as parents can do something about it. We can talk to our kids. We can let them know that if they bring something to us, our first action isn't going to be to take away their access. They're not going to surface something if they think they're going to lose their ability to play games or talk with their friends. Titania says the best way to talk to your kids about this is just to be direct. Let them know there are dangerous people out there, but you're always a resource for them if they need someone to talk to. Yeah, that's a conversation we've had to have with our kids. They're spending so much more time online because of digital learning. So what's the advice for that? Should they spend less time doing that? No, but she does want parents to monitor where their kids are spending time online. So if it's a game, make sure you take advantage of those free parental controls. If there's a chat function, make sure you know who your kids are talking to. But more than anything, just letting your kids know that they can talk to you. Tyson Foods will temporarily cut prices for some beef products by 20 to 30 percent. It is an incentive for people to buy meat as grocery prices go up. It's one of three things you may have missed today. It applies to the meat they sell in supermarkets and restaurants. The coronavirus has impacted production at their plants, and that drove up meat prices. Tyson processes a fifth of the nation's beef. Traffic is down, way down, which is why for the first time in 20 years, AAA will not issue a Memorial Day travel forecast. The annual forecast estimates the number of people traveling over the holiday weekend, but due to COVID-19, people aren't driving. Therefore, AAA says it is canceling this year's projections, but they expect it to return for 2021. Last year, 43 million Americans traveled for Memorial Day weekend. That will certainly not be topped this year. Charged and arrested in Atlanta, love and hip hop star is in jail after allegedly using a coronavirus loan to buy a Rolls Royce. Maurice Fain, who stars in VH1's Love and Hip Hop, is charged now with federal bank fraud. This after allegedly misusing funds from a PPP loan. Fain runs a corporation called Flame Trucking. The affidavit alleges that Fain was given more than $2 million and used $1.5 million of it to lease a Rolls Royce. Also to buy thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, including a diamond ring and a Rolex. Also to spend thousands on child support. An attorney for Fain says there was confusion regarding the loan guidelines. 
According to the president, companies that should have received PP loans have until the end of the day to return it. Well, I had a really nice sunset set up for us here, but these darn high clouds, which stopped us from having a really pretty morning this morning, have now ruined the sunset for this evening. But if you have a nice sunset, don't forget to send those in to us on the 11 Alive Storm Crackers Facebook page. A very warm sunset at 78 degrees this evening. Temperatures nice all around North Georgia. It's 77 in Duluth, Marietta. Canton also down there in Thomaston still at 80 degrees in Peachtree City. Carrollton, you are at 76. It's not showing up on our satellite and radar product here, but there is that deck of relatively thick clouds way high up in the sky. We call them some thick cirrus clouds out there. That's pretty much it. Really quiet weather for the next few days. The uh, eyes of the weather world will be to our south of the Caribbean. This is where there's a very high chance of either a tropical system or a subtropical system and don't worry about knowing the differences between the two. It's likely going to develop in this little red area right here and if it gets strong enough, it may be named Arthur. The good news is this is not going to have a whole lot of impacts on us. The only thing I see is maybe some rough surf, Florida, Georgia and coastal in the Carolinas. And this thing is going to get it out to the northeast. It may actually give us a little bit of moisture to work with for a cold front that's set to come through next week and a little bit of moisture to feel a little muggy outside for this weekend as we're going to be underneath the hot pattern. Temperatures approaching 90 degrees this weekend. A cold front should come through on Monday. It's going to give us a decent shot of some showers and thunderstorms beginning Sunday night and lasting through early on Tuesday. A couple days cool down because of that cold front, but just a couple days. We'll get back to this big bump in the jet stream by next weekend and that will likely put high temperatures once again back into the 80s maybe even closer to the 90s again for next weekend so really really warm weather setting up for that the next two weeks or so we'll call passing clouds tonight only 60 degrees it's very comfortable overnight lows highs tomorrow will range from the 70s in the mountains or 79 in Gainesville to the middle 80s Eaton ten yard 84 LaGranger also at 84 80 in Carrollton I'm putting us at 83 for a high temperature here in Atlanta and it'll start off cloudy tomorrow morning but we'll have more sunshine in the afternoon kind of similar to what we dealt with today a nine on the wasometer that's our scale from 1 to 11 where 11 is a perfectly seasonally average day here's your seven day forecast we're in the upper 80s for Saturday that's when we're near 90 by Sunday in fact if we see a decent amount of sunshine, the more than what it looks in right now, we could get into the lower 90s on Sunday. Better bet of that occurring to the south of us in central Georgia. A 40% chance of rain on Monday. We're back in the 70s Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, there is a, a number of young people that are aspiring toward jobs in professions they long to be a part of. Meet sixth grader Joshua Cornett broadcasting from Duluth with the very latest on COVID-19. He is embracing our 11 Alive slogan. Smart kid here. Stay true to our channel for facts, not fear. Stay at home, Duluth! Today's day is April 2nd, and my name is Joshua Cornett with Channel 12 News. Governor Kemp issued a stay-at-home order for all Georgians today. What does that mean? That means stay at home, do not go out. And do remember, even apart, we are all in this together. Now, let's check in with JC for a sports update. Yeah, there are still no sports. Let's look back at this pandemic and remember the heroes. The list includes doctors and nurses who worked long hours, sometimes not being able to see their families, all to save the ones who were sick. There were truck drivers, we continue to deliver the items people desperately needed. The scientists working long hours trying to find a vaccine and a cure. Grocery store workers who continued working where we could have food. And of course, teachers who had to adjust to di digital learning for themselves and their students, while often having to take care of their own families. These heroes deserve a lifetime of thanks. And as students return to school, Return to sports and return to hanging out with their friends. Let's always remember the heroes. Well done, Joshua. I want to encourage you. I was your age when I began over at WAGA with Pam Martin and Forrest Sawyer, so you can do it too.
Remember to share the acts of kindness as you see in your community. It just seems I was that young. You can share them on Twitter using the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. So ahead, some high school seniors having to cope with the fact that a traditional graduation may not happen for them. Well, they're getting a very special way to commemorate this occasion from a local photographer making sure that this milestone doesn't go unnoticed or undocumented. By outside workers, the best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their meant to be a time of celebration for high school seniors with graduations and so much more. But the coronavirus, uh, the coronavirus, of course, has changed all of that. But as Liza Lucas shares, one woman is using her camera to make sure grads still get to document a special moment in their cap and gowns. I happened to turn the camera around and didn't see it until I saw it through the lens and it took me back. This just shows what they're going through. A cap and gown may be the tradition, but a mask marks the new normal for graduating seniors like Yafet Abraham. Learning students may not get their chance to walk across the stage. Louise Dolman wanted to help. I'm a self-employed hairdresser and I'm out of work. After doing all the projects I could find at the house, I got bored. One of my clients called me and asked me to take her daughter Skylar's pictures. All of a sudden, people just started calling me and I'm just doing these kids photo shoots and I love it. The photos capturing the smiles and commemorating students achievement with confetti. And yet the reason for the pictures, bittersweet. Like this is something I've been looking forward to for years, but now I don't really get to do it. You've been waiting for this for so long and for it to be like taken away from you, it's just, it doesn't feel real, but you know, you just gotta stay positive. Louise hopes the photos will give students something to hold on to. I think I'll be glad that I actually got pictures of my tapping gown. Like, even if I'm not walking, I have some cool pictures to actually look at and remember. The portrait's a flash of the class of 2020. I'm trying to tell a little bit about them through my photography and a little bit about what's going on with history. And the seniors, they're just doing great. Honestly, they have the best attitude. I'm proud of them. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Tonight, we are looking into the history of the police department that responded to the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery but did not make any arrests. Arbery, the young African American man, was shot and killed while jogging in February. Police say he was chased down by Travis and Gregory McMichael, father and son, who are white. Prosecutors allegedly had this video for weeks. It was not until it was released to the public last week that the GBI got involved and the father and son were charged and jailed with murder. William Roddy Bryan, who recorded the video, has not been charged. His attorney previously said he showed the video immediately to police and was just a witness. The Glynn County Police Department responded to the Arbery shooting in documents, uh, and it shows that it is a department of the troubling past. A grand jury once described the department as having an ongoing culture of cover-up. Faith Abube uncovered years of details about the department. <laughs> The first time Ahmaud Aubrey's mother learned someone had killed her son, it was the Glenn County police officer on the other end of her cell phone. He went on to say that Ahmaud had been involved in a burglary, and in the midst of the burglary, Ahmaud was confronted by the homeowner. And during that confrontation, there was a, a tussle over the handgun, and Ahmaud was shot and killed. Wanda Cooper says she knew her son's character, but she also did not question what the investigator was telling her. Because the way that I lived is if authority and they came and told you anything, you didn't question that. But months later, that version of the story doesn't match an official police report and the multiple videos surrounding the deadly shooting. That the video directly contradicted every statement made to the staff. The case has put the troubled police department in the spotlight. 
The reveal has uncovered an internal investigation report, grand jury findings and lawsuits against the department alleging corruption, a culture of cover-up and abuse of power. The documents also allege false statements, tampering with evidence, influencing or intimidating witnesses, hindering arrest of one of their own and destroying or not properly maintaining public records. This is a department that is not necessarily following the rules and is, is kind of uh, made up of a lot of rogue actors. Darren Penn is an Atlanta attorney representing a woman suing the Glynn County Police Department for allegedly mishandling her daughter's domestic violence case. That daughter was married to a police officer in the same department. And they're going through a divorce. He is not allowed in my house. This is not his house. Mr. Corey Sasser, um, an incredibly violent and out of control police officer for the Glenn County Police Department. The former Glenn County police officer killed his estranged wife and another man before turning the gun on himself in 2018. Penn says the officer's wife complained to the department repeatedly but they failed to arrest the officer when it mattered. And he thinks that parallels what's happened in the Arbery case. Just the overall hesitancy to do anything about it, to investigate them, to make any kind of arrests, to, to, to actually, at the end of the day, protect the public. In February, five days after the Ahmad Arbery shooting, the Glynn County Police Chief and three high-ranking police officers were all indicted on multiple criminal charges. They include having sex with confidential informants, violation of oath of office, influencing a witness, and a criminal attempt to commit a felony. Their case is related to a disbanded drug task force. A grand jury report also concluded, quote, there is an ongoing culture of cover-up, failure to supervise, abuse of power, and lack of accountability within the administration of the Glynn County Police Department. It paints a very troubling uh, picture uh, of a police department that is not following procedures. The department now has a new interim chief and its former officer and DA investigator Gregory McMichael is now facing murder charges with his son, Travis McMichael. Justice for all. Public outcry has pushed the Arbery case into new hands. Those of a special prosecutor in Cobb County, the DOJ and the GBI. And we are hopeful that that investigation will actually do a lot more than the original investigation to uncover the truth. Reached out to the police department and the county manager about these findings and they have not responded. With continuing shortages of face masks and face shields for our dedicated health care professionals, urgent calls have gone out for supplies. And when the Paulding County Chamber of Commerce learned about the need, they acted quickly. And as Bill Liss found, the results have been overwhelming. Within hours of getting the call from the Wellstar Hospital in Paulding County that face shields were in short supply, the County Chamber of Commerce got right to work. The race was on to produce 3D face shields for the medical teams focusing on COVID-19. The first step was get a supply of 3D machines. The chamber got 22. The next step, get volunteers. We had approximately 40 volunteers. Uh, we trained those volunteers by pay it forward routine. We had the process down so fine that uh, we actually had some uh, young adults and some children that were able to come in and, and work for us also. Volunteers worked in shifts around the clock at Chamber Headquarters to turn out the face shields, and they're still at it, already turning out more than 3,200 face shields, and they have plans to keep up the effort. 2,500 of those will be distributed to Wellstar Paulding Hospital. We also have been um, asked to produce some for our local health department, some of our home health care agencies, as well as some other entities throughout our county. What brings it all together are the Paulding County volunteers. They are dedicated and they're determined. One of them is Gary Jones. We want to be able to make some of these safety shields for our health care workers so they can continue uh, their part in what they do. And that's, of course, helping other people uh, get well. And that's an awesome feeling. Jones has his own 3D machine at home, and he continues making the shields each night after he leaves the chamber workshop. The Paulding County Chamber of Commerce says it looks forward to other counties in Georgia reaching out to them for help in setting up similar face shield efforts for healthcare professionals working around the clock to treat COVID-19 patients. Major League Soccer trying to figure out a plan to save and start the season, which may have the players quarantined in a place like Disney in Orlando. Alex Glaze tells us what the players think about possibly having to play. Atlanta United is one of the teams that has returned to training as MLS reportedly eyes return to play 
in June. I think the idea of playing games seems very exciting. I think there's nothing more I want to do right now than run out and just resume my schedule as things are normal. MLS has reportedly proposed placing all 26 teams in Orlando this summer and playing games without fans at the Disney Sports Complex and possibly other sites. Players, coaches, and support staff would live under quarantine for an undetermined amount of time. To get everybody's mind right, body right, I think that plays a big part of all because this one is just a physical sport, this one, it's one which, you know, demands a lot mentally and it is going to be hard to get away for a few months or so to get these games out of the way. So if that does come up, we just need to make sure we come up with solutions for us as players where, you know, they're looking after ourselves on the mental side as well. For some players, the potential of being away from family for an undetermined amount of time is a concern. If I go into a field, I want to give all I can. And if I'm going to give all I can, potentially for a month, two months, two or three weeks, wouldn't be enough for me. I think the risk is very, very high because, you know, there's a chance we could go out and get injured for the sake of two months to play and we can miss, you know, you know how some of these injuries are. The reported proposal has not been agreed upon, but has been sent to the union. Ahead on prime time, we have the very latest into a high profile inside traitor investigation. Why a senator, a U.S. senator, is being forced to step aside on a powerful committee. The pollen count today relatively low, only at 62, but moderate levels of trees, grasses, and of the mold as well. These numbers up here will likely be increasing this weekend. I'll let you know why coming up. And a top government scientist who was fired from his job is speaking out. Next on Primetime, why he says the nation's fight against COVID-19 isn't looking good. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do.
A top government scientist who would have been leading the U.S. race for a coronavirus vaccine testified before a House committee today. He says he was removed from his job for political reasons and laid out a grim prognosis for the months to come. Here's Alice Barr of NBC in Washington to explain. They'll load it, they'll mix all the power. President Trump visiting Pennsylvania today, touring a medical supply plant and pushing the state's Democratic governor to reopen faster. We have a lot of people want their freedom and they'll get their freedom very soon. While on Capitol Hill, an ousted whistleblower, Dr. Rick Bright, told a House committee the Trump administration ignored his dire early warnings in a slow response to the coronavirus crisis. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. But time is running out because the virus is still spreading everywhere. Dr. Bright says he was transferred out of his role overseeing federal vaccine development after repeatedly warning of critical shortages of medical supplies. Those alarms were not responded to with action. And resisting efforts to promote the drug hydroxychloroquine that President Trump has often touted. The evidence for its benefit was weak and the evidence for its safety concerns was stronger. Republicans on the committee defending President Trump. But this hearing is not about a whistleblower complaint. It's about undermining the administration during a national and global crisis. The president dismissing Dr. Bright's testimony. To me, he's nothing more than a, a really uh, disgruntled, unhappy person. As President Trump shifts his focus to resuscitating the economy, he was met today in Pennsylvania by demonstrators staging a mock funeral, saying it's too soon to reopen. While pockets of protest around the country demand an end to shutdowns. Amid new reports, nearly three million Americans filed first-time unemployment claims last week, bringing the total to more than 36 million claims since the crisis began in March. Republican Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina is temporarily stepping down as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. This comes <coughs> after the FBI served a, war a search warrant for his phone. It's all part of an ongoing insider trading investigation tied to the coronavirus pandemic. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced the move earlier today. FBI officials served the warrant at Burr's home yesterday. They're investigating whether he broke the law with a well-timed sale of stocks before the coronavirus caused markets to plummet. The Justice Department declined to comment. His attorney did not respond to phone and email messages. Well, to cut costs, Atlanta-based Delta is saying goodbye to more than a dozen jets. Delta is removing all 18 Boeing 777 planes from its fleet. In a memo to employees, the company says it was a tough decision, but it's necessary in order to protect finances, jobs, and the company's future. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, charges from the Boeing 777s are expected to reach up to $1.7 billion pre-tax in the second quarter. U.S. health officials have released part of the report which contains specific guidance on how businesses can safely reopen. Today, the CDC posted a set of six decision, decision tool documents. The one-page documents use traffic signs and other graphics to tell organizations and businesses things to consider before reopening. A more extensive list has been prepared, but it has not been posted yet. The CDC drafted this guidance more than a month ago. However, it was initially shelved by the Trump administration for more consideration. Well, when you woke up this morning, you probably saw a whole lot of clouds on top of us. In fact, we were stuck at 62 degrees from 3 a.m. all the way until 8 a.m. this morning, and it didn't look like it was actually going to turn into a warm day. But it surely did. We cleared up. We got temperatures into the 80s later on this afternoon. In fact, 83 was the high here in Atlanta, 81 in Canton, 78 in Gainesville, 75 in Blairsville. Look down here, LaGrange and Thomaston and Peachtree City got into the middle 80s for high temperatures today. That's what the weather is going to be like for us here in Atlanta this weekend. Those middle to upper 80s and places like Thomaston and LaGrange could even get to the 90s this weekend as well. We have a nice set up for a sunset here and that's usually high clouds but unfortunately this shot over truest park is kind of blocking uh, the sun sunset was just after 8 30 this evening really comfortable outside 78 degrees at hartsfield jackson 70s all around north georgia canton's already cooled off to 73 blairsville's already at 67 it's still 80 in athens and in peachtree city i actually wouldn't be surprised if athens and peachtree city haven't updated yet because everybody else around them have cooled off into the lower 70s as well. We did see that 
deck of clouds over us at Truist Park. That's what most of us are seeing. Some thicker clouds, though, should begin to filter in off to our west later on tonight. And then a big area of clouds in the Caribbean. This showers and thunderstorms, a little L over there. This is the center of a storm system, a developing storm system, rather, that we're going to watch move over to this red blob right here. And that's where we think this may turn into either a tropical storm system or a subtropical storm system. The only difference is tropicals, it's warm. It gets its moisture or its energy from the warm waters in a subtropical. It just means it gets its moisture or it gets its energy from the difference between hot and cold temperatures. So one of the other could develop. You don't need to know all that. Just know there's a good chance of that symptom developing and it could get strong enough to be dubbed Arthur, the first name storm of the year. This setup we have here with a big bump in the jet stream is what's given us these warm temperatures and it's also a very conducive setup for the formation of that big storm system in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. This jet stream is going to take that storm out to sea, but it may provide a higher uh, chance for some rip currents, rip tides, or maybe even some strong winds in coastal Georgia, Florida, and the Carolinas, depending on how close this thing gets. But for the most part, we're going to be hot and muggy this weekend with the help of some of that moisture from that storm system. A cold front will come through on Monday. It'll chop off a lot of this humidity and a lot of the warm weather, bring us some showers and thunderstorms, maybe as late as Sunday night through early in the day on Tuesday. It'll also bring us a couple days of relief with cooler temperatures from Tuesday into Wednesday. However, Thursday and onward, we'll see this big bump move on top of us over again in the southeastern United States, and that means highs will be back into the upper 80s, maybe even into the lower 90s in next weekend. So this weekend and next weekend are going to be rather warm, unseasonally warm at that. But this is very seasonally average, 60 and comfortable for an overnight low with those cl uh, passing clouds. 83 from a forecast of high temperature here in Atlanta. Same thing in Thompson, Peachtree City, LaGrange, Eatonton. You're getting to 84, I think, for a high in the 70s in the mountains. 80 for a forecasted high temperature in Duluth. I'll give it a 9 on the wasometer. That's a scale from 1 to 11, where 11 is a perfectly seasonally average day. I had to knock it down a couple because of the clouds and the warm temperatures. 89 for a high on Sunday. 20% chance of rain mainly in the evening. There's the decent shot of some showers and thunderstorms on Monday. We'll cool off to the 70s for a couple days, Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we're back in the 80s by Thursday. Even further than that, we may get near 90 into next weekend. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
we are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. My team is here to help you navigate what's real and what's fake during this pandemic. My name is Ronnie Taylor from Forrester, Maryland. Ronnie came to us asking about a rumor on a pretty difficult subject. He heard that during this pandemic, those who die in the hospital, whether it's from COVID-19 or anything else, must be buried in a hospital gown or whatever they were wearing at the time. I want to be buried in my red skin gear when it's my time. So I'm need to know if I need Whenever I go to the hospital, do I need to carry my gear with me? So let's verify. In general, are funeral homes not allowing you or your family to choose your burial outfit? I think it's a very real fear. Ellen McBriar is the spokesperson for the National Funeral Directors Association. She told us that she hasn't heard of any funeral homes with this policy. She says that choosing that final outfit is crucially important for those who are left behind. We had a family the other day that said, this 30 minutes, it's all we want with her. When they, they walked in and said, we haven't seen our mom in three weeks. And with tears streaming down their eyes, they said, she looks beautiful. That's how I remember her. Thank you for the gift. Jim Doyle from the Maryland State Funeral Association says the confusion might be due to the increase of what are called direct burials. That's when a family requests a burial without a viewing. When this happens, typically the body would not be dressed. However, there's nothing stopping the family from making that request. So in general, that rumor that Ronnie heard is false. I'm a diehard fan. I just want to be with them always. Touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. NASCAR has made more of its race schedule official, and that includes a race weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway in Hampton on June 6th and 7th. At long last, we're going to see the real deal. And in addition to the cup race, there will be a truck and Xfinity race that weekend as well. Of course, it's all closed fans. The track has been shut down since March. The week the Folds of Honor 500 was originally scheduled, but the track says they are ready and they have received the OK from Governor Kemp. They will sanitize and they will work to ensure everybody is safe. While the process has taken longer than we would have anticipated, we certainly understand all of the steps that have been taken to, to make sure that not only we can go racing, but that we can do so in a safe environment for the, the essential staff that will be here and for the community. The Falcons virtual offseason continues, but that's starting to raise some questions for assistant coaches like Dirk Cutter. Falcons offensive coordinator admitted today he is not sure what new running back Todd Gurley's health is. He is not sure. For the past few seasons, Gurley, as you know, has battled a knee injury. It's reduced his workload. Hasn't looked like the running back we remembered in Athens. Meanwhile, Cutter knows Gurley's value, and he has questions. The main question is, that, that no one seems to know is, you know, what's his what's his health status, you know, and what what's his workload, you know, we'll, we'll just see. But I mean, you can't you can't deny his his talent and what he's already done in this league. The question is, is uh, his health. But you sign him to a big deal like that, and then you're still not sure if he is set and ready to go. It's very interesting. Eleven Alive News primetime on the ATL starts now. The facts will come out. All of the facts will come out. Right now in prime time, a message for the public from attorneys representing one of the men charged for Ahmaud Albury's murder. A look into their courtroom history as more details emerge about the case. We can't know the progress in the fight against COVID-19 without wading through a sea of numbers we put into context for you and answer your questions about where Georgia stands tonight. And check out the mighty C-130 Hercules from Dobbins Air Reserve Base honoring Georgia's frontline health care workers. The flyover traveled all the way up to Dalton before passing over hospitals in Rome, Cartersville and Hiram. Hope Ford got a firsthand look at all the action. From the runway to the sky. We saw the belly of the plane that just fly over and everybody clapped and waved and, and uh, we've seen my husband worked on them when he was working at Lockheed back in 1954. I'm glad they're still flying after all this time. The two C-130H3 planes took off with an important mission to thank him, thank her, thank all of them for their work during the pandemic. These health care workers witnessed the air salute, which lasted for a total of 10 seconds above their heads. It feels nice to be appreciated. It does. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been an emotional and tough few months as they battle COVID-19. If you work with good people, then it's easy to get through. Yep. So Aww. that's true. <laughs> that's the only thing that keeps us alive is our friends at work. So. And just as fast as the planes came, they were gone. And it was time for these heroes to head back to their own mission. Just wear the mask every day and that's what gets old. But um, just got to do what you got to do and take care of everybody. And I'm standing on top of the Blue Tower deck at Kennestone Hospital over Kennesaw, where the planes flew over that building and right over this building, too, uh, just a few hours earlier this evening. Now, the flyover lasted a total of 41 minutes, soaring over six cities and hospitals. All right, Hope, we did have a couple of viewers wondering if they were going to get any love with some flyovers in south of Georgia. Yeah, they're definitely going to get some love. The Georgia Guard is going to fly over nine hospitals tomorrow morning. We have all of those locations. You can find that on my Facebook page. Just search my name, Hope Ford, and you'll be able to find all of those uh, nine locations they'll be flying over tomorrow. All right, thank you so much, Hope Ford. Beautiful shot tonight. All right, so we do want to see your videos and photos capturing tonight's salute in the skies. Just text them to us, 404-885-7600. Also, be sure to include your name and where you're from. 
We're also putting together a gallery of your best photos on our website, 11alive.com. In spreading the virus, Hall County had been a hotspot with the coronavirus outbreak among poultry plant workers. Uh, most recently, the county is reporting fewer new cases. The governor will tour Farmdale Fields on his visit tomorrow. Now, it is one of the largest independent poultry producers on the planet. Jennifer Bellamy has a closer look at how other counties are doing it right now. So much of the coronavirus response is driven by the numbers, and each day we're getting emails from you asking us to give you a better sense of where we stand with each case, what we're seeing. So let's start in Fulton County. Each bar along the bottom of this graph represents a single day, but we're going to focus on this area down here. It's going to be the red zone, and that marked with that red square is what we're talking about. That's when we started reopening Georgia. Overall, cases seem to be leveling off in Fulton County after a big spike on May 6th. We'll be keeping an eye on that area for you. In Cobb County, a similar trend with cases holding steady since May 6th, not really improving or declining overall. But in Clayton County, we are seeing a bit of a decline since about May 6th. So if you have any questions about the numbers, we ask you to please let us know. You can text them to us at 404-885-7600. And remember, that's a text, not a call. Also, leave us your name and where you're from. We'll work to get you some answers. Almost 250,000 Georgians filed for unemployment last week. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is putting, putting those numbers together for us and putting them into perspective and looking at the industries that are the most hardest hit. The unhappy march of pandemic-related unemployment continues to hit the food service industry hardest, with many of its furloughed and laid-off workers seeking work in other lines of business. It's just a matter of right now kind of how to earn money, you know, I'm doing things like looking at Uber Eats, and like delivering food, whatever for right now. In Georgia, unemployment claims were at their highest in early April, then slowly dropped. They leveled out somewhat in mid-April with a quarter million or so new claims each week. The Labor Department has paid claims to 575,000 unemployed Georgians, more than the previous four years combined. But hundreds of thousands haven't been paid. Furloughed from his job in the auto service industry, Brian Butcher was one of them. Counting what you get with the federal and the state, I mean, it's about $4,000 worth of money. So it's, uh, yeah, it's put our family in a bind. We sent Butcher's complaint to the state, and we were told this afternoon that the state resolved it. And in fact, Butcher says that his employer has recalled him to work as of early this month. A bright moment and a story that has far too few of them. Well, as you know, 11 Alive is dedicated to answering all of your questions about COVID-19, jobs, and Georgia's economy. Just click on our special coronavirus section of the 11 Alive app for answers to your most frequently asked questions, including who is still hiring. Four attorneys, all with experience in big public cases, will represent a father and son charged in one of the most high-profile murder cases Georgia has seen in years. 25-year-old Ahmad Albury was jogging in Brunswick in a neighborhood on February 23rd. Investigators say he was followed, shot and killed by two white men. No arrests were made for nearly three months. Two days after video of the confrontation was released on social media, the GBI arrested Gregory and Travis McMichael. That was the video you just saw of their arrest. Father and son are now charged with murder. A third man, William Roddy Bryan, recorded that video that went viral. He has not been charged. The McMichaels have been in jail for a week now. Today, for the first time, we are hearing from the lawyers representing the son, Travis. Joe Henke talked with the defense team representing Travis McMichael. They say people haven't heard all the facts. Representing Travis McMichael are attorneys Robert Rubin and Jason Sheffield. We are all too aware how high the emotions are running in this case. Ahmad Arbery was shot on February 23rd in the Satilla Shores neighborhood of Brunswick. Weeks passed, and then after this cell phone video capturing the shooting appeared on social media, and 74 days after the shooting, Gregory and Travis McMichael were arrested. The delay in the arrest sparking protests across the nation. Travis's attorneys say they are still interviewing witnesses, reviewing videos and other evidence, and will wait until trial to present their case. Whether it's in Glen County or someplace else, the government will have an opportunity to present its evidence in a court of law. And then, and only then, then you can judge. 
For Rubin, this will only be his latest high profile case. His past cases include defending an Atlanta public school principal in the seven month long APS cheating scandal trial and Hemi Newman in the 2012 Dunwoody daycare murder where Newman was found guilty. His latest client, Travis McMichael, made this 911 call less than two weeks before Arbery's death. I was leaving the neighborhood and I just caught a guy running into a um, house being built. An attorney for the owner of the home in question shared this video with 11 Alive showing an unidentified man in the home on February 11th. But well, we've been having a lot of burglaries and break-ins around here lately mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I had a pistol stolen January 1st actually and uh, you know he, he's I've never seen this guy before. In the a Glynn County police report shows police responded on February 11th but did not find the man. The owner of the home in question also released this clip showing a man who appears to be Arbery in the same home on February 23rd, moments before his death. The homeowner confirms he does not know the McMichaels and says nothing was ever stolen or damaged from the home. Earlier, we received a statement from the legal team representing the Albury family, Lee Merritt, Benjamin Crump, and L. Chris Stewart. It reads in part, we agree with the attorneys for Travis McMichael that the justice system affords all citizens the presumption of innocence and that there shouldn't be a rush to judgment or stereotyping. We only wish that their client, Travis McMichael, had provided that same presumption of innocence to Ahmaud Albury before chasing and killing him. You'll find the full statement. Just head to 11alive.com. Ahmaud Albury family will share their story with the national audience tomorrow. They're going to be on Dr. Phil's show. This is your baby boy. What do you want to see happen? I want all involved, prosecuted to the highest. And you believe that's three people? Yes. That's Ahmad's mother, Wanda Cooper. Dr. Phil will also talk to the family's attorney, Lee Merritt, about their push for justice and new details emerging about the case. You can watch this Dr. Phil exclusive tomorrow at 3 p.m. on our sister station, 11 Alive. You're going to find much more about the Ahmad Albury case on 11alive.com, including previous allegations of mishandling by the Glenn County Police Department. See what our reveal investigators found when they dug into this reported culture of cover up. A warning for parents as kids stay home from school. A tech safety company says it is reporting more online predators. What you can do to protect your children next on Primetime. Your 11 Alive Storm Trackers watching some more of those clouds rolling in tonight here in twilight time. Looking out over the battery where some of the businesses are open for business. So coming up, the weather you can expect the next few days and when we can see the hottest day of the year so far. All right, Sam, we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Zoo Atlanta will officially reopen to the public this Saturday at 10 a.m. with a, a few changes starting today. Guests will only be able to buy tickets online. All building and indoor experiences will remain closed, except for restrooms, of, or restrooms, of course. Masks for visitors are not required, but strongly encouraged. Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. It is the 
kind of statistic that will certainly get a parent's attention. It comes from a tech safety company in Atlanta called Bark. It says 23% increase it has seen in the number of online predators that this company has had to report to law enforcement just since the quarantine started. Caitlin Ross talked to the chief parenting officer who says it's something every parent needs to watch very closely. It's heartbreaking and disgusting and terrifying. Um, and we hope all parents, you know, and caregivers listen. Bark Chief Parenting Officer Tatanya Jordan says as soon as your children are old enough to use technology, they're old enough to hear about dangerous people who might try to talk to them online. You, you have to talk about these things because it absolutely can happen to your child. She says they knew there would be a rise in online predator activity when they realized how long kids would be stuck at home. But they didn't think it would be this big of an increase. Their data is supported by a recent alert by the FBI warning parents to be vigilant about screen time. Their schedules are off. They don't all have to be up and on the bus, you know, by 6 a.m. Bark uses technology to monitor messages sent to kids' devices. And Jordan says they're watching predators take advantage of the uncertainty during COVID-19. Predators know that children are anxious. They miss their friends. They are lonely. She says online predators also know that some families are struggling financially right now. A lot of games require upgrades and coins and that sort of thing. And if the economy being what it is and things are tight, that could be another tactic they use to send financial gifts and coins for upgrades. But she says that doesn't mean your kids have to be vulnerable. We as parents can do something about it. We can talk to our kids. We can let them know that if they bring something to us, our first action is it going to be to take away their access. They're not going to surface something if they think they're going to lose their ability to play games or talk with their friends. Titania says the best way to talk to your kids about this is just to be direct. Let them know there are dangerous people out there, but you're always a resource for them if they need someone to talk to. Yeah, that's a conversation we've had to have with our kids. They're spending so much more time online because of digital learning. So what's the advice for that? Should they spend less time doing that? No, but she does want parents to monitor where their kids are spending time online. So if it's a game, make sure you take advantage of those free parental controls. If there's a chat function, make sure you know who your kids are talking to. But more than anything, just letting your kids know that they can talk to you. There is a bill being introduced right now in Congress that uh, is actually going viral on social media. It's about families being separated and forced vac uh, vaccines. Here's Jason Puckett to verify those claims. Many of you sent us claims about H.R. 6666 and pointed us to some viral videos. There are multiple out there, but they all share a common claim. Basically, this act is to allow individuals to come into your house and if you've got a cough, they're going to use that to pull you or your loved ones, especially your children, away under pretense of public safety. This claim is also repeated in a change.org petition calling for the bill to be removed. So we're verifying. Does H.R. 6666 require at-home testing and authorize forced quarantines? That claim is false, and we're going straight to the source. The bill's creator, Representative Bobby Rush of Illinois, said the bill does not authorize anyone to enter your home or remove anyone because of the coronavirus. We're also going to look at the bill itself. This bill isn't hundreds of pages of legal jargon. It's five pages front to back and I strongly recommend you read it. It's called the Testing, Reaching, and Contacting Everyone Act, or TRACE Act. If passed, the only power it would give the government is letting the Secretary of Health and Human Services give financial grants. There's no language about mandatory testing or forced quarantines, period. With Rep. Rush's statement and the text of the bill backing him up, we can verify the claims H.R. 6666 allows forced testing and quarantine are false. Also, a few of you asked us about the number. 6666 includes the biblical number of the beast, but that's just an unfortunate coincidence. The U.S. Government Publishing Office confirms that bills are numbered, quote, in the order in which they are introduced. So it was simply the 6,666th bill introduced in the House. Got other questions for us? Send us an email. May is meant to be a time of celebration for high school seniors for graduations, prom, all that fun stuff, right? But we know coronavirus changed everything. As Liza Lucas shares, one woman is using her camera to make sure grads still get a documented moment in that cap and gown. I happened to turn the camera around and didn't see it until I saw it through the lens. And it took me back 
This just shows what they're going through. A cap and gown may be the tradition, but a mask marks the new normal for graduating seniors like Yafit Abraham. Learning students may not get their chance to walk across the stage. Louise Dolman wanted to help. I'm a self-employed hairdresser and I'm out of work. After doing all the projects I could find at the house, I got bored. One of my clients called me and asked me to take her daughter Skylar's pictures. All of a sudden, people just started calling me and I'm just doing these kids photo shoots and I love it. The photos capturing the smiles and commemorating students' achievement with confetti. And yet the reason for the pictures, bittersweet. Like this is something I've been looking forward to for years but now I don't really get to do it. You've been waiting for this for so long and for it to be like taken away from you, it's just, it doesn't feel real. But you know, you just gotta stay positive. Louise hopes the photos will give students something to hold on to. I think I'll be glad that I actually got pictures of my tapping gown. Like even if I'm not walking, I have some cool pictures to actually look at and remember. The portrait's a flash of the class of 2020. I'm trying to tell a little bit about them through my photography and a little bit about what's going on with history. And the seniors, they're just doing great. Honestly, they have the best attitude. I'm proud of them. Well, your 11 Alive store and tracker is doing a great job today, showing those clouds that were drifting by from time to time. Mary Beth Etheridge in Stockbridge, showing us those puffy, white, cumulus clouds drifting by. Temperatures were nice and warm on the south side in Stockbridge. And then this afternoon, Blake Robb sending up his drone, showing us the, this is wide expanse panoramic of those clouds. And we'll see more clouds moving in tonight and into tomorrow, a mixture of sunshine and clouds. But it looks like tomorrow could start out kind of overcast, much like today did. And today we still managed to heat up into the low 80s as those temperatures warmed up. And we saw highs shape up like this, 83 in Atlanta, 83 in Rome, it was 85 in LaGrange, 86 in Thomaston, and 75 in Blairsville. So from the mid-70s to the mid-80s all across North Georgia today as that ridge of high pressure was our dominant weather feature. And it's also keeping these thunderstorms that are off over Louisiana and Mississippi, it's going to keep them riding up and over the ridge. We call those ridge riding storms. And we have these clouds that are going to be coming in, kind of washing over the ridge a little bit. So it will be a little cloudy to start again tomorrow, but I think we'll see enough sunshine to warm it up even a little warmer than it was today, perhaps. So another thing we're watching as we head towards the weekend is going to be this area of low pressure. It's already developed here south of the Florida Keys. We expect it to continue to strengthen, and the National Hurricane Center now giving it an a 70% chance in the next two days of developing into a tropical system or a subtropical system, meaning a, 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 a tropical system would have warm core characteristics, subtropical would just have some more extra tropical type of characteristics, and it would have cool parts and warm parts. And we're going to end up seeing the effects of this storm, whether you call it subtropical or tropical, all up and down the coastline as we head into the weekend. Florida, Georgia, and the Carolina coasts potentially seeing some big waves. And another interesting thing that's going to happen as the system moves parallel to our coastline is it's going to bring in some hot and humid air for us. So it's actually going to help our temperatures reach the hottest temps we have had so far this year. Yes, we could see some 90 degree readings as we head through this weekend, if not here in North Georgia, then in Middle Georgia. So the hot, hot temperatures are going to be settling in here as we head into the duration. Frontal system will move in on Monday. That'll bring in a little cooler air for at least a couple of days and some showers and thunderstorms on Monday. So we'll see cooler temperatures and a little bit of rain and then a warm up uh, towards the end of next week. So here's that system as it parallels the coast moving on up. Most of the rain will stay off the coast as far as the tropical system is concerned, but we will have some uh, big waves and a strong rip current as a result of this. And we'll have to watch the showers on approach. There may be a few that try to work their way in late Sunday and of course on Monday once that, that frontal system moves through. So Monday is the day we'll likely see some showers and some thunderstorms during the day. Not a big rainmaker for us. It's going to pass through pretty quickly here. So this is Monday at 8 o'clock, and you can see all the rain across 
all of Georgia, actually, north to south, and we'll have that tropical or subtropical system off Cape Hatteras. It should keep on moving into open waters, though. So clouds mixed with sunshine. We should have the warmest temps of the year this weekend, and then we're going to be heating up in the tropics. You know, hurricane season begins June 1st, and it looks like we're off to an early start this season. And if you go back and look at the last few years since 2016, we have had a name storm in the month of May. So yes, it's rare, but not out of the question. So here we go again, right? So the next seven days, we'll end up seeing those temperatures really warm up. We'll be close to 90 on Sunday, mostly dry weekend. And then we'll end up seeing that rain move in on Monday. That brings in a little cooler air for the start of next week. Gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you. The Verify team is here to help you navigate what's real and what's fake during this pandemic. My name is Ronnie Taylor from Forestville, Maryland. Ronnie came to us asking about a rumor on a pretty difficult subject. He heard that during this pandemic, those who die in the hospital, whether it's from COVID-19 or anything else, must be buried in a hospital gown or whatever they were wearing at the time. I want to be buried in my red skin gear when it's my time. So I am need to know if I need, whenever I go to the hospital, do I need to carry my gear with me? So let's verify. In general, are funeral homes not allowing you or your family to choose your burial outfit? I think it's a very real fear. Ellen McBriars, the spokesperson for the National Funeral Directors Association, she told us that she hasn't heard of any funeral homes with this policy. She says that choosing that final outfit is crucially important for those who are left behind. We had a family the other day that said, this 30 minutes, it's all we want with her. When they, they walked in and said, we haven't seen our mom in three weeks. And with tears streaming down their eyes, they said, she looks beautiful. That's how I remember her. Thank you for the gift. Jim Doyle from the Maryland State Funeral Association says the confusion might be due to the increase of what are called direct burials. That's when a family requests a burial without a viewing. When this happens, typically the body would not be dressed. However, there's nothing stopping the family from making that request. So in general, that rumor that Ronnie heard is false. I'm a diehard fan. I just want to be with them always. 
A man convicted for hiring a hit man to kill his wife dies in prison. Next, how Fred Tokar's case left a mark on Cobb County and all of Metro Atlanta. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This Welcome back, everyone. You know, it was one of the most infamous murder cases in Cobb County. A mother shot and killed in front of her sons. Her husband, prominent attorney Fred Tokars, was convicted of hiring a hitman. And we have learned that Tokars died in federal prison, but his lawyer tells 11 Alive's John Sherrick, that he helped save many lives, many innocent people. Thanksgiving weekend 1992, Sarah Tokars and her two young sons kidnapped from their Cobb County home, the kidnapper forcing her to drive her SUV down the street, and that's where he shot her in the head in front of her sons. Police eventually charged Sarah's husband, Fred Tokars, with hiring the hitman. Tokars always proclaiming innocence. I emphatically deny any involvement in my wife's murder. I became very depressed and started to think of the lifestyle that I was losing. Not only my wife, but my, my whole lifestyle. Tokars was convicted in both federal court and state court, sentenced to multiple life sentences. Prosecutors saying he had Sarah killed because she had discovered he was using his law practice for drug dealing and money laundering, and he was afraid she would turn him in. You know, he said he didn't do it. Tokars attorney Jerry Froelich of Atlanta says he just learned that Tokars, who was in poor health, died in a federal prison in Pennsylvania over the weekend. Froelich says that while Tokars was in prison, he would get fellow inmates to confide in him about murders and murders 
murder plots, and then Tokars would turn them in and testify against them one after another. What he, what he did for the government, I mean, he saved lives. He solved murders, he saved lives. Using his law skills in the final years of his life, Froelich says, for good. But I was really, and have been angry, that they didn't reduce his sentence after he put his life and he solved those things. Fred Tokars, dying in prison more than 27 years after Sarah was killed, to the end, never admitting guilt. Now, this was a case many of our colleagues covered at 11 Alive, especially John Sherrick back in the 1990s. And you can see a full timeline right on our website at 11alive.com. Tonight, we're looking into the history of the police department that responded to the shooting death of Ahmad Albury, but did not make any arrests. Albury, a young black man, was shot and killed while jogging in February. Police say he was chased down by Travis and Gregory McMichael, who are white. Prosecutors allegedly had this video for weeks, but what you just saw was video of the father and son being arrested nearly three months later. And it wasn't until the video was released to the public that GBI got involved and the father and son were charged with murder. William Roddy Bryan, who recorded the video, has not been charged. His attorney previously said he showed the video immediately to police and was just a witness. The Glen County Police Department responded to Albury shooting. Documents show it is a department with a troubling past. A grand jury once described the department as having an, quote, an ongoing culture of cover-up. Faith Abu Bay uncovered years of details about that department. <laughs> The first time Ahmaud Aubrey's mother learned someone had killed her son, it was the Glen County police officer on the other end of her cell phone. He went on to say that Ahmaud had been involved in a burglary, and in the midst of the burglary, Ahmaud was confronted by the homeowner. And during that confrontation, there was a, a tussle over the handgun, and Ahmaud was shot and killed. Wanda Cooper says she knew her son's character but she also did not question what the investigator was telling her. Because the way that I live, this, if authority and they came and told you anything, you didn't question that. But months later, that version of the story doesn't match an official police report and the multiple videos surrounding the deadly shooting. That the video directly contradicted every statement made to the staff. The case has put the troubled police department in the spotlight. The reveal has uncovered an internal investigation report, grand jury findings and lawsuits against the department alleging corruption, a culture of cover-up and abuse of power. The documents also allege false statements, tampering with evidence, influencing or intimidating witnesses, hindering arrest of one of their own and destroying or not properly maintaining public records. This is a department that is not necessarily following the rules, and is, is kind of uh, made up of a lot of rogue actors. Darren Penn is an Atlanta attorney representing a woman suing the Glynn County Police Department for allegedly mishandling her daughter's domestic violence case. That daughter was married to a police officer in the same department. And they're going through a divorce. He's not allowed in my house. This is not his house. Mr. Corey Sasser, um, an incredibly violent and out of control police officer for the Glynn County Police Department. The former Glenn County police officer killed his estranged wife and another man before turning the gun on himself in 2018. Penn says the officer's wife complained to the department repeatedly, but they failed to arrest the officer when it mattered, and he thinks that parallels what's happened in the Arbery case. Just the overall hesitancy to do anything about it, to investigate them, to make any kind of arrests, to, to, to actually, at the end of the day, protect the public. In February, five days after the Ahmad Arbery shooting, the Glynn County Police Chief and three high-ranking police officers were all indicted on multiple criminal charges. They include having sex with confidential informants, violation of oath of office, influencing a witness, and a criminal attempt to commit a felony. Their case is related to a disbanded drug task force. A grand jury report also concluded, quote, there is an ongoing culture of cover-up failure to supervise, abuse of power, and lack of accountability within the administration of the Glynn County Police Department. It paints a very troubling uh, picture uh, of a police department that is not following procedures. The department now has a new interim chief, 
and its former officer and DA investigator Gregory McMichael is now facing murder charges with his son, Travis McMichael. Justice for all. Public outcry has pushed the Arbery case into new hands. Those of a special prosecutor in Cobb County, the DOJ, and the GBI. And we are hopeful that that investigation will actually do a lot more than the original investigation to uncover the truth. We reached out to the police department and the county manager about these findings. They have not responded. Well, as you know, there is a shortage of face masks and face shields for health care workers all across Metro Atlanta. So when the Paulding County Chamber of Commerce heard about it, they jumped into action immediately. Here's 11 Alive's Bill List. Within hours of getting the call from the Wellstar Hospital in Paulding County that face shields were in short supply, the County Chamber of Commerce got right to work. The race was on to produce 3D face shields for the medical teams focusing on COVID-19. The first step was get a supply of 3D machines. The chamber got 22. The next step, get volunteers. We had approximately 40 volunteers. Uh, we trained those volunteers by pay it forward routine. We had the process down so fine that uh, we actually had some uh, young adults and some children that were able to come in and, and work for us also. Volunteers worked in shifts around the clock at Chamber Headquarters to turn out the face shields, and they're still at it, already turning out more than 3,200 face shields, and they have plans to keep up the effort. 2,500 of those will be distributed to Wellstar Paulding Hospital. We also have been um, asked to produce some for our local health department, some of our home health care agencies, as well as some other entities throughout our county. What brings it all together are the Paulding County volunteers. They are dedicated and they're determined. One of them is Gary Jones. We want to be able to make some of these safety shields for our health care workers so they can continue uh, their part in what they do. And that's, of course, helping other people uh, get well. And that's an awesome feeling. Jones has his own 3D machine at home, and he continues making the shields each night after he leaves the chamber workshop. You know, the Paulding County Chamber of Commerce says that they are ready to help any other health care workers in any other counties if they need it. All they have to do is give them a call. Major League Soccer is trying to figure out a plan to start the season, which may have the players quarantined in a place like Disney in Orlando. Alex Glaze tells us what the players think about possibly having to play. Atlanta United is one of the teams that has returned to training as MLS reportedly eyes return to play in June. I think the idea of playing games seems very exciting. I think there's nothing more I want to do right now than run out and just resume my schedule as things are normal. MLS has reportedly proposed placing all 26 teams in Orlando this summer and playing games without fans at the Disney Sports Complex and possibly other sites. Players, coaches, and support staff would live under quarantine for an undetermined amount of time. To get everybody's mind right, body right, I think that plays a big part at all because it's one, it's just a physical sport, this one, it's one which, you know, demands a lot mentally and it is going to be hard to get away for a few months or so to get these games out of the way. So if that does come up, we just need to make sure we come up with solutions for us as players where, you know, they're looking after ourselves on the mental side as well. For some players, the potential of being away from family for an undetermined amount of time is a concern. If I go into a field, I want to give all I can. If I'm going to give all I can, potentially for a month, two months, two or three weeks, wouldn't be enough for me. I think the risk is very, very high because, you know, there's a chance we could go out and get injured for the sake of two months of play and we can miss, you know, you know how some of these injuries are. The reported proposal has not been agreed upon, but has been sent to the union. The 11 Alive storm trackers are watching some showers and storms well off to our west, trying to work their way in, but high pressure is kind of stopping them in their tracks. So coming up, what you can expect on your Friday and when we may see the hottest day of the year so far. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. As businesses start to open up across the country, the Verify team is tackling this question. Can an employee refuse to come back to work because they don't think it's safe out? Can they be fired for doing this? The bottom line is yes and no. There's a lot of gray air for both sides. Helping us out are two employment law experts, Scott Oswald from the Employment Law Group and Mark Pierce, the executive director for the Workers' Right Institute at Georgetown Law School. They emphasize that each individual case is different, but there are some main points. First off, nearly every state in the country and the District of Columbia are what's called employment at will states. That means you can be fired for no reason or any reason at all, so long as it's not discriminatory. So in that sense, yes, you can be fired if you all out refuse to come back to work, but it gets more complicated. You see, both experts agree that workers have the right to demand a safe workplace and employers must take reasonable action to follow safety guidelines. Pierce tells us that this is laid out in section 502 of the National Labor Relations Act. Employees can refuse work in an extremely unsafe working condition. So employees can ask questions like, is there enough PPE? Are employees being kept six feet apart? If an employer is unwilling to assure that employee that it's following the guidelines, then an employee is well within a right to say, hey, you know, it's not good enough. I'm not coming back. And that brings us to a laundry list of caveats. If you're in a collective bargaining agreement, then your union may offer more protections and leverage and getting safer conditions. If you're considered high risk, your employer may be required to offer reasonable accommodations to avoid violating the Americans with Disabilities Act. And finally, if you're a first responder, the bar for staying home gets really high. It might be an unsafe situation, but if there's a duty to care for patients, that might override those kind of considerations. So generally speaking, yes, you can be fired if you refuse to return to work. And yet we are allowed to demand safety at work. And it's in this legal gray area where our experts say there's likely to be a lot of employment disputes in our future.
The first case of coronavirus was confirmed in Georgia on March 2nd. And I tell you what, folks, and you know this, it has been a long, challenging two and a half months. And as more states are beginning to reduce some of those restrictions, a lot of attitudes are changing now across our country. 11 Alive's Jennifer Bellamy has more now on a new poll and how Americans feel about these new changes. For the last few months, Americans have been through a range of emotions as the nation deals with COVID-19. But now we're starting to see more hope among those feelings. A new Monmouth University poll found fewer Americans are concerned that a family member could become seriously ill with the virus. 42% say they're very concerned. That's compared to 50% last month. The change comes despite more Americans saying they know someone who's contracted coronavirus. That number is up to 40% from 26% in April. Financially speaking, 40% said they'd suffered a loss in income, and 31% said at least one person in their household had been laid off due to the pandemic. Still, the survey found that American optimism, while taking a slight dip, was still strong. 63% of Americans said they were very hopeful that their lives would get back to normal as soon as we get past the coronavirus pandemic. And we will continue bringing you updates and perspective on the coronavirus. You'll find much more coverage on 11alive.com and in our 11 Alive app. The 11 Alive storm trackers tracking those rising temperatures. And do you remember just one week ago today, it was cloudy and rainy all day, and we were in the 50s all day. Today, 83 degrees in Atlanta, 85 in LaGrange, 86 in Thomaston, and just getting warmer as we head into the weekend. So right now, we're still pretty mild out there if you still have to take the dog out or get in a little bit of exercise before you turn in. 74 in Atlanta, 73 in Rome, we're at 72 in Athens, and 75 in Atlanta. And the next 12 hours, those temperatures are going to be very warm overnight, just getting down into the low 60s. So we won't have that chill in the air. And also, a little more moisture is in the air, too, so it won't be as dry. So it's going to feel pretty mild as you head out the door tomorrow. And by mid morning, maybe you're taking a break, a little walk around the block. 66 degrees at around 10 a.m. It'll be kind of cloudy, much like it was today. But by lunchtime, we should start to see some of these clouds breaking up a bit. Still managing to make it into the mid mid 70s by lunchtime. You may want to take your lunch outside. It'll be a dry day. And as you head into the afternoon, maybe you're working outside on your deck or your patio, or your balcony, and 83 degrees is where we should be around 4 p.m. Very, very warm indeed, much like today was, but I think a little more afternoon sunshine. So that's going to lend itself to a higher UV index. It's expected to be around 10. That is very high. That means within 15 minutes' time, you could start to do some damage to your skin. So make sure you uh, wear a sunscreen or a hat, sunglasses. Always need to protect those eyes. So we're looking at the radar right now, and there are a few showers trying their best to work their way in, but this ridge of high pressure is saying, nope, I'm going to squash you, I'm going to suppress you, and you're not going to make it in, and he's making it right, he, like it, like it has a gender. This high pressure system is going to direct those showers right up and over that ridge. There's another thing we're watching on the radar on the satellite, and that is this area of low pressure here south of the Keys, and this is what we're going to have to watch for possible development, and it may end up being our first named storm of the Atlantic hurricane season. You can see it's just a little area of low pressure right now that formed off of a front south of the Keys. It's going to continue to deepen. It's going to continue to strengthen the next 24 to 36 hours. And it has a 70% chance within the next two days of becoming uh, an, a tropical or a subtropical system. It may end up being a tropical storm, a subtropical storm, but it does appear that it will be strengthening. We have an 80% chance the next five days. That just means the timing on this developing into something really notable will be Friday, Saturday, but it will impact the Florida coast, the Georgia coast, and the Carolina coast. See the models in complete agreement here. I just kind of whizzed by you here, but that showed it moving parallel to the coast and then out north of Bermuda now. So uh, not being very impactful, not making Making any landfall anywhere, but definitely whipping up the surf here along the coastline and making for some strong rip currents. So if you are happen, happening to be heading towards the coast, the east coast, 
this weekend, the Florida, Georgia, the Carolina coast, there's going to be some big waves. It's going to be warm here, and that system's actually going to help us warm up this week. Yes, this tropical system, counterclockwise flow around it, will pipe in some hot and humid air for us this weekend, so we're probably going to see some 90s, if not in North Georgia, in Middle Georgia, and we're going to come very close here as well. So you can see we'll have some clouds to start. This is Friday morning. They'll break up a bit in the afternoon, maybe a shower or two in far north Georgia. That's not out of the question. Friday or Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'll end up seeing things uh, get a little cloudy late in the day, rain overnight into Monday, and we'll have those showers and thunderstorms. That'll be a possibility into early Tuesday, and that'll bring in a little cooler air for us as well. So pretty warm the next few days, peaking on Sunday. That'll likely be the hottest day of the year so far. Rain moves in late into Monday, and that front on Monday bringing in some storms will also bring in a little cooler air for our Tuesday and Wednesday. But stay tuned to our channel for facts, not fear. A spunky young anchor is entering the Atlanta news scene. You won't want to miss his special report on COVID-19 coming up after the break. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you first responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. All right, watch out news stations. There is a new anchor in town. Sixth grader Joshua Cornett is broadcasting from Duluth tonight with the latest on COVID-19. He's even embracing our 11 Alive slogan. Stay true to our channel for facts, not fear. Stay at home, Duluth. Today's date is April 2nd. My name is Joshua Cornett with Channel 12 News. Governor Kemp issued a stay-at-home order for all Georgians today. What does that mean? That means stay at home, do not go out. And do remember, even apart, we are all in this together. Now, let's check in with JC for a sports update. Yeah, there are still no sports. 
Just look back at this pandemic and remember the heroes. The list includes doctors and nurses who worked long hours, sometimes not being able to see their families, all to save the ones who were sick. There were truck drivers who continued to deliver the items people desperately needed. The scientists working long hours trying to find a vaccine and a cure. Grocery store workers who continued working where we could have food. And of course, teachers who had to adjust to di digital learning for themselves and their students, while often having to take care of their own families. These heroes deserve a lifetime of thanks. And as students return to school, return to sports, and return to hanging out with their friends, Let's always remember the heroes. Well, temperatures are going to be warming up in a big way the next few days. So we are in the 80s. In fact, in the upper 80s by Sunday, a mostly dry, very warm weekend with some rain possibly moving in late Monday. Better chance on uh, late Sunday into Monday where we'll have a 40% chance of showers and storms and then things cool off behind the front. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Live news primetime on the ATL starts now. And right now at 10 on this Thursday, how high will they go? Grocery prices on the rise in Metro Atlanta. We're looking at when they might drop again.
We never get tired of seeing this. Another flyover and a thank you to our health care and essential workers. We have reaction from nurses who watched it. And serious accusations against a former University of Georgia football player. His NFL career in jeopardy. A former number one pick as police are trying to track him down. First tonight, don't rush to judgment. That is the message from the legal team now representing one of the men charged with murdering Ahmad Arbery. The 25 year old was jogging in Brunswick back in February when police say he was chased down by a white father and son who shot and killed him. For months, the man remained free. Last week, this video surfaced showing the confrontation. It sparked national outrage and compelled the GBI to lead the case. Soon after the father and son were charged with murder, Joe Hankey spoke with the attorneys for the son, Travis McMichael. Travis and Gregory McMichael have spent one week in jail and both now have defense teams working on their cases. Travis McMichael is being defended by Decatur attorneys Robert Rubin and Jason Sheffield. No matter how you look at this case, a young man has died and that is always a tragedy. Prosecutors say this cell phone video captures an unarmed Ahmad Arbery as he jogged through a Brunswick neighborhood in February before allegedly being confronted by the McMichaels and shot by Travis. We will be presenting our evidence in a court of law. McMichaels attorneys today not discussing specifics of the case as they complete an independent investigation. We are asking everybody who's following this case, who is reading about it, who's reading about it piecemeal, who is who are forming opinions without knowing all the facts to just take a breath. Rubin's past trials include defending an Atlanta public schools principal in the seven month long APS cheating scandal trial. And here Rubin is shaking hands with Hemi Newman, whom he defended during the 2012 Dunwoody daycare murder trial, with Newman being found guilty. Travis's father, Gregory, now represented by Macon attorneys Franklin and Laura Hogue. The husband and wife team releasing a statement reading in part, while the death of Ahmad Arbery is a tragedy causing deep grief to his family, a tragedy that at a first appears to many to fit into a terrible pattern in American life, this case does not fit that pattern. The full story to be revealed in time will tell the truth about this case. Franklin Hogue's past cases include representing Stephen McDaniel in 2011, who pleaded guilty to murdering and dismembering Mercer University Law School graduate Lauren Giddings. Lauren Hogue previously served as president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Gregory McMichael's attorney plans to hold their own press conference tomorrow. A mysterious letter left at Albury's memorial raised some questions. Now investigators say they know who left it. The letter reads, quote, I'm so sorry I should have stopped them. So it made people wonder if another person could be involved in this case that we don't know about. But today the GBI dispelled any rumors about that. Investigators say they have figured out who left the note and they are not connected to the case in any way. The person was simply expressing their condolences. Governor Kemp will go to Gainesville in Hall County tomorrow to highlight how they are stopping the spread of the virus. Hall County had been a hot spot with a COVID-19 outbreak among poultry plant workers. Most recently, the county is reporting fewer new cases. Governor Kemp will tour a Farmdale field on his visit tomorrow. It's one of the largest independent poultry producers in the world. Now, so much of the virus response is driven by numbers. Every day we are getting emails from you asking us to give you a better sense of where we stand in these cases. Here's what we know. Tonight we are highlighting three counties, beginning with Fulton. Each bar along the bottom of this graph represents new cases for a single day. We're focused on this area in the red zone. Now, that's when we started reopening Georgia. Overall, cases seem to be leveling off in Fulton County after a big spike on May 6th. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Meanwhile, in Cobb County, a similar trend with cases holding steady since May 6th, not really improving or declining overall. But in Clayton County, we're seeing a bit of a decline since about May 6th. If you have a question about the numbers, let us know. You can text us at 404-885-7600. And remember, please text, don't call, and let us know your name and where you are texting from. So when you're in the grocery stores here in Metro Atlanta and you're looking at the higher prices, your eyes are not deceiving you. Unfortunately, grocery prices here really have gone up higher and faster than any other part of the country. How high and when will they come down again? Here's John Sherrick. 
The headlines about grocery store prices nationwide, full of words like soaring. They're talking about this, the 2.6% increase nationwide from March to April, and break it down. In Atlanta, up 4.3% from March to April. Ouch, that's, uh, that hurts. Emory University economist Douglas Bowman says farmers, manufacturers, wholesalers in the nation's coronavirus hotspots facing increasing costs from dealing with the virus and slowing down production temporarily, passing the higher costs on to the retailers. But Bowman says, look, where infections have decreased, such as the former hotspot of Seattle, grocery prices there up less than 1% last month. Which suggests that, you know, once things cut, start to settle down, we might be okay. Grocers here for now, passing the higher prices on to customers for what is available to maintain their profit margins of maybe 1% or 2% to stay in business. Kathy Kazala of the Georgia Food Industry Association. As more plants get, um, get up again running, I think that there's going to be more supply coming in the stores and as a result the prices will, will start going down. Starting to go down or at least stabilizing she believes possibly by the end of May. Kroger emailed us that the one way customers can actually shop quote smarter is to go to their supermarkets websites look for those weekly sales and download those digital coupons. I gotta start doing that. 11 Alive is dedicated to answering your questions about COVID-19, jobs, and Georgia's economy. Just click on our special coronavirus section of the 11 Alive app for answers to your most frequently asked questions, including who is still hiring. It is a stirring sight. The Hercules C-130s, a thank you. For all of the healthcare workers, the Air Force Reserve flew two aircrafts from Dobbins Air Reserve Base to thank all of the health workers for their efforts during the pandemic. Our team of journalists captured the American Strong flyover at the Reserve Base and Kennestone Hospital in Kennesaw. From the runway to the sky. We saw the belly of the plane that just fly over them and everybody clapped and waved. For Judith and Joyce Barber, this moment served as a flashback. My husband worked on them when he was working at Lockheed back in 1954. I'm glad they're still flying after all this time. The two C-130H3 planes took off with an important mission. To thank him, thank her, thank all of them for their work during the pandemic. These healthcare workers witnessed the air salute, which lasted for a total of 10 seconds above their heads. It feels nice to be appreciated. It does. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been an emotional and tough few months as they battle COVID-19. If you work with good people, then it's easy to get through. Yep. So Aww. that's true. <laughs> that's the only thing that keeps us alive is our friends at work. So. And just as fast as the planes came, they were gone. And it was time for these heroes to head back to their own mission. Just wear the mask every day and that's what gets old, but um, just gotta do what you gotta do and take care of everybody. And I'm standing on top of the Blue Tower deck at the Kennestone Hospital in Kennesaw, where the planes flew over earlier this evening. The flyover lasted about 41 minutes, soaring over six cities and, uh, and a couple, couple more hospitals. Yeah, you know what, I hope so many people were planning to get to the right spot and they spent days trying to figure it out. Then it took them a while to get to that location. And then when the event actually happened, poof, they were gone very quickly. Yeah, a lot of people standing out here were kind of surprised at how fast they went by. There were a couple of people who were actually standing around waiting for more planes because they just couldn't believe how fast it all went. One nurse did tell me, though, that it did kind of serve as a reminder to appreciate every second you have. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it's kind of a metaphor. Life goes by pretty quickly, too. Hope Ford, thank you. Oh, yeah. A string of smash and grab burglaries in Atlanta is baffling police. It happens so often they are asking for the public's help. Here's 11 Alive's Ron Jones. A string of business break-ins across southeast Atlanta. <laughs> police think someone in a getaway car dropped off these guys to tear through stores in the area. They work quickly. The latest burglary was less than a week ago, right here on Grant Street Southeast. But 11 Alive learned it's more than just burglaries that are a problem in this neighborhood. In the last 30 days, within a two-mile radius, there have been multiple assaults, robberies, and even homicides. These thieves walk out with products and even the stores safe. Atlanta police say call them if you have any information about the crime. 
A local reality TV star in some legal hot water. A coronavirus loan program leads to a series of wild allegations. There are a few showers and storms well out to our west over Louisiana and Mississippi. They're trying to make their way past this ridge, but I don't think it's going to happen. So coming up, when those temperatures will be at their hottest. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect. Some breaking sports news tonight involving a former University of Georgia football player, former number one draft pick, great star, great player. There are arrest warrants out in Florida for DeAndre Baker. He's now the NFL football giants. Police say Baker and another NFL player, Quentin Dunbar, had semi-automatic weapons with him as they stole money and watches from people at a party. Baker's arrest warrant is for four counts of armed robbery with a firearm and four counts of aggravated assault with a firearm. The Giants say they are unaware of that situation. They won't be saying that by tomorrow. We are following the latest in a tragic story. A high school senior killed days before graduation along with her older stepsister. It's still a mystery what exactly happened more than 24 hours after their bodies were found under an overpass near Rome. But tonight, the GBI is calling it a homicide and completing autopsies on both. 11 Alive's Latasha Givens with the very latest. GBI agents are in the beginning stages of this double death investigation, but they need the public's help to find out how the sisters died and why. Something a family friend say they need for closure. She was like my sister. Mm -hmm. um, I've known her ever since I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. And she was 11 Karen person and I'm just heartbroken. Kayla Dotson is mourning the tragic death of her friend, 31 year old Trevina Campbell. She says their mothers were best friends who lived in the same apartment complex as they grew up. We spoke with Dotson as she waited with the family outside the police station Thursday. Campbell and her younger stepsister's bodies were discovered Wednesday underneath an overpass near Rome. The Floyd County School District says 19 year old Vanita Vera Richardson was supposed to graduate high school next Saturday. When you found out it was her, what went through your mind? Oh, I was all in tears. Um, I couldn't I couldn't sleep hardly because me and her is really, really close. In a statement, Floyd County School says Vanita will be remembered for a fun, loving, humble and motivated student who was making strong plans for her future. Even throughout the school closures, Vanita's passing is felt by all, in particular, the staff members whose lives she touched with her caring personality and big heart. Dotson says losing two loved ones at the same time has been difficult for the family. They're, they're really upset. Um, it's just a very, very hard time for them. And for the Rome community as well. Everybody's really sad and 
um, they're just mulling over her death because she was well known in Rome. GBI is leading this investigation and haven't released details about the manner in which the bodies were found, a motive, or if they have any leads in this case. But investigators do need your help. In a tweet, officials asked anyone traveling in the area between Tuesday around 10 p.m. and Wednesday at 11 a.m. who possibly saw something suspicious to call police. Charged and arrested, an Atlanta reality TV star is accused of using a coronavirus loan to, among other things, lease a Rolls Royce. Maurice Fain, who stars in VH1's Love and Hip Hop Atlanta, is charged with federal bank fraud, this after allegedly misusing funds from a PPP loan. Fain runs a corporation called Flame Trucking. The affidavit alleges Fain was given more than $2 million and used $1.5 million of it to lease a Rolls Royce, buy thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, including a diamond ring and a Rolex, and spend thousands on child support. An attorney for Fain says there was confusion regarding the loan guidelines. According to President Trump, companies that should not have received PPP loans have until the end of the day to return that money. All righty, we are now uh, in full gear toward the weekend. And of course, we begin paying very, very close attention to the old whizometer. We make sure it has a lot of a lot of fuel in it so that we get the proper reading. Isn't that how it works with compasses? <laughs> and there's a squirrel that runs around back there and then a Briggs and Stratton engine and all of that. No, it's just premium high octane <laughs> fuel. Yes, yeah, the sure fuel, the wasometer. <laughs> and it's going to be it's going to be gassed over the weekend because we're going to have those temperatures hotter than they have been uh, so far this year. So we're expecting some very warm temps, a little humid, too. Now, we had those clouds on the increase today. One of our 11 Alive storm trackers had his drone up in the afternoon. Blake Robb, thank you for posting these on our 11 Alive storm tracker Facebook page. Big cumulus clouds did not keep us from heating up. We still saw unseasonably warm temps today. 83 in Atlanta and Rome, 85 in LaGrange, 86 in Thomaston. So some very warm temps today, and it's still pretty mild out there if you still need to get out and take that last stroll or take the garbage out or whatever before you go to bed. Low 70s in Atlanta right now and in Rome it's still 73, 72 in Eatonton and 70 in Athens. So we're looking at a mild night. We'll see some clouds on the increase so it may be a little gray when you wake up in the morning but don't despair. I think those clouds will thin out a little bit in the afternoon and we'll definitely be heating up. It'll be a day pretty much a carbon copy of today. You know, we started out overcast, the clouds broke up, and we really warmed up. We've also had some showers we're watching that are trying to work their way into Alabama. We'll see an increase in the cloud cover as these try to work their way through that ridge of high pressure. They're not going to make it all the way. We may have a few sprinkles in North Georgia. We'll definitely have increased clouds, and high pressure will continue to warm us up on Friday. We're also watching this down in Florida, on the southern tip of Florida, this area of low pressure that has developed along that old front that moved through here earlier in the week. This low is going to continue to develop, and the National Hurricane Center has been watching this for the last few days, and now gives a 70% chance of developing into a subtropical or a tropical system within the next two days, and an 80% in the next five. So we're thinking that time frame will be sometime Friday into Saturday, impacting the East Coast, though, all the way up Florida coast, the Georgia coast, and the Carolina coast. And the most noticeable thing here is going to be the hot and humid conditions as we're going to see this air going counterclockwise around that low, a very warm source directing it right across us. So that's one reason we'll have some 90 degree readings across our state on Sunday. That'll likely be the hottest day of the year so far. And that hot air will linger over the weekend. Then the jet stream will take a dip. A front will move through on Monday and that will serve to cool us off a little bit and bring in some showers and thunderstorms during the day on Monday. And that'll take our temperatures back down a notch. But here it is on the American model showing that circulation of what could be Arthur, either tropical storm or subtropical storm Arthur, if it gets that strong, paralleling the coast, bringing in some big waves and rip currents up on the Georgia coast and into the Carolina coast as well. And then we'll see the rain moving in here late Sunday and Monday as some showers, some thunderstorms, not a huge rainmaker, but a little bit of rain and a little bit of cooling. So we'll see those temperatures on the rise the next few days. We should peak on Sunday. The rain moves in Sunday night, Monday, cools us back off once again to some nice temperatures on Tuesday and Wednesday. This is a great weather wow moment. We want to show you 
you the work by Pam Dowdy, one of our Lemon Alive Storm trackers. Bluebirds, a daddy bluebird feeding his baby, and it is just so adorable, and we thank her for posting that. And if you'd like to post your work on our Lemon Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page, all you have to do is join. Just go to our Lemon Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page, and we will approve you. Those are beautiful birds. Still to come, what's the best way to reopen a state? We're seeing a push and pull across America. A lot of different ideas. We'll take a look as some people are growing impatient. Act with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. It's become a constant struggle, Jeff, how, what, and when businesses should open back online as the coronavirus continues to spread. And the answer to that difficult question is being answered differently by communities all across America. Here's NBC's Jay Gray with the very latest on what lies ahead for so many right now. The national tug of war continues. The push to open, the pull to keep things locked down. The CDC today releasing new guidelines on personal protection, social distancing, sanitizing, gathering and reopening based on a community's rate of infection. Uh, one thing that I recognize, one size does not fit all. And that's the reality across much of the country right now. The return to business gradual. In many places, the number of customers restricted and staying six feet apart. Employees and patrons required to wear masks and other protection. It's going to take a while for us to get back to normal. Normal. The idea and opportunity is Cheers. intoxicating for many in Wisconsin. Bars opening as the state Supreme Court overturns stay-at-home orders. First thought, we, we flipped it right into the parking lot, and yeah, we got to get in and have a first drink. A sip. The governor worries could bring with it a dangerous coronavirus hangover. We're going to have more cases. We're going to have more deaths. And it's, it's, a, sad, it's a sad occasion for the state. Stretches of the California coast are allowing visitors now. They must maintain social distancing in the sand. In Chico, this mall opening its doors. At this time, I don't feel a lot of concern and worry. But not every shopper's sold on the idea. I think it's too soon. I don't think that um, we're really ready for that yet. 
The debate over reopening, like the virus, growing. All right, Jeff, time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late, coming up on 11 Alive in about 35 minutes. Happy Friday Eve to you. Happy Friday. We are getting ready for the weekend, Aisha. Not that far off. Thanks. Have a great night. We'll see you on 11 Alive in about 35 minutes. Here's what's coming up on the Big 36. The federal government has targeted a North Carolina senator, but could their next focus be on Senator Kelly Leffler from Georgia? We'll have the very latest in a live report. And every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household. Tonight, Senator Kelly Leffler is on the defense. This comes as one of the leading Republicans in the U.S. Senate now stepping down from his role as a chairman. The FBI and its agents seized his cell phone, all part of an investigation into insider trading tied to the coronavirus pandemic earlier in the year. Ryan Kruger is live in Atlanta to explain a, a potentially tangled web. 
Yeah, that's right, Jeff. And uh, late this evening, Senator Kelly Leffler's office told me that she has handed over documents to the Justice Department, but insists that no search warrant has been served to her. Uh, again, this is all after she faced a bunch of scrutiny back in March after she and her husband made millions of dollars worth of stock trades right before the stock market plummeted due to the coronavirus pandemic. I spoke with one former federal prosecutor who said it's likely that FBI agents are looking into her activities. Republican Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina finding himself at the center of an FBI investigation after he sold millions of dollars in stocks after receiving intelligence briefings about the COVID-19 pandemic. To authorize a search warrant of a sitting United States senator, that's breathtaking. He's one of several U.S. senators to come under scrutiny about their stock trades, including Georgia's Kelly Leffler, who sold millions of dollars in stocks in companies that later dropped significantly. Leffler's aides say she has not received a search warrant from the FBI, but one former federal prosecutor says she might be getting a visit soon. They can prove uh, that Senator Burr was in fact trading on inside knowledge that he got from a briefing and others seem to have done the same thing and heard that same information. That raises serious problems for all them. In a statement, a spokesperson said Senator Leffler has forwarded documents and information to the Justice Department, the SEC, and the Senate Ethics Committee, establishing that she and her husband acted entirely appropriately and observed both the letter and the spirit of the law. And in March, Senator Leffler said that she was not involved with her stock sales. You know, they are a very wealthy couple, and oftentimes, you know, you, you have people that do that, where they pick stocks or they pick investments, and that has been her defense in this from the very beginning. Yeah, that's correct, Jeff. Uh, she and her husband argue that they have investment managers, a third party, and they handle all the straight the, the they handle all the trades. So Leffler and her husband have no knowledge about any of the trades. Uh, you also mentioned they are a wealthy couple. One thing to point out, Senator Burr, it's estimated that his stock trades he made that was upwards of 75 percent of his total net worth that he was trading. Meanwhile, Kelly Leffler worth more than half a billion dollars. So the trade she made only represents a fraction of her total net worth. At the very yeah. least, the optics on this have never been very good. All right, Brian Kruger, thank you. A top government scientist who would have been leading the U.S. race for a coronavirus vaccine testified before a House committee today. He said that he was removed from his job for political reasons and laid out a grim prognosis for the months to come. Meanwhile, President Trump is in the battleground state of Pennsylvania as we learn more bad news today about the state of the economy. Here's NBC's Alice Barr in Washington with the very latest. President Trump visiting Pennsylvania today, touring a medical supply plant and pushing the state's Democratic governor to reopen faster. We have a lot of people want their freedom and they'll get their freedom very soon. While on Capitol Hill, an ousted whistleblower, Dr. Rick Bright, told a House committee the Trump administration ignored his dire early warnings in a slow response to the coronavirus crisis. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. But time is running out because the virus is still spreading everywhere. Dr. Bright says he was transferred out of his role overseeing federal vaccine development after repeatedly warning of critical shortages of medical supplies. Those alarms were not responded to with action. And resisting efforts to promote the drug hydroxychloroquine that President Trump has often touted. The evidence for its benefit was weak and the evidence for its safety concerns was stronger. Republicans on the committee defending President Trump. But this hearing is not about a whistleblower complaint. It's about undermining the administration during a national and global crisis. The president dismissing Dr. Bright's testimony. To me, he's nothing more than a, a really uh, disgruntled, unhappy person. As President Trump shifts his focus to resuscitating the economy, he was met today in Pennsylvania by demonstrators staging a mock funeral, saying it's too soon to reopen, while pockets of protest around the country demand an end to shutdowns. Amid new reports, nearly 3 million Americans filed first-time unemployment claims last week, bringing the total to more than 36 million claims since the crisis began in March. We will not know until next week what the state's current unemployment rate is. And here is what we do know. Nearly a quarter million new unemployment claims submitted just last week. The state has paid record amounts to people out of work. Yet 
There are people still waiting for their unemployment benefits. Here's 11 of Livestock Richards looking into it. Because many businesses can't operate fully or at all because of the pandemic, they're laying off and furloughing workers in record numbers. The food service industry is the top industry that's costing people jobs. Restaurants and related industries slowed down or closed in droves over the last two months. And so it was kind of just a situation where they had to give everyone unemployment since there was nothing that we could really do. In Georgia, new claims for unemployment keep coming in each week. They peaked April 4th, then slowly dropped. In mid-April, they started leveling out, fluctuating in the quarter million range each successive week. The state labor department has issued payments to 575,000 unemployed Georgians since the middle of March, more than the previous four years combined. Some of those claims came from the auto sales industry, which has slowed down as well. Brian Butcher filed his claim following a furlough more than a month ago, but got no response. What was frustrating is all my coworkers got their benefits starting the week after we were furloughed up until last week, and I got nothing. Labor Commissioner Mark Butler says newly installed technology plus some human error has slowed down some unemployment claims. And they will most likely be approved as long as they can prove their situation. After we talked with Brian Butcher, we sent his complaint to the Department of Labor, and we learned early this afternoon that it got fixed. A small victory in a sweeping story of economic hardship. It is the kind of statistic that will get a parent's attention. It comes from a tech safety company in Atlanta. Bark, and we have spoke of this, country, uh, of this company prior, is reporting a 23% increase in online predators. They had to report to law enforcement since the quarantine began. Their chief parenting officer told our Caitlin Ross it is something all parents should be watching very closely. It's heartbreaking and disgusting and terrifying. Um, and we hope all parents, you know, and caregivers listen. Bark Chief Parenting Officer Titania Jordan says as soon as your children are old enough to use technology, they're old enough to hear about dangerous people who might try to talk to them online. You, you have to talk about these things because it absolutely can happen to your child. She says they knew there would be a rise in online predator activity when they realized how long kids would be stuck at home, but they didn't think it would be this big of an increase. Their data is supported by a recent alert by the FBI warning parents to be vigilant about screen time. Their schedules are off. They don't all have to be up and on a bus, you know, by 6 a.m. Bark uses technology to monitor messages sent to kids' devices, and Jordan says they're watching predators take advantage of the uncertainty during COVID-19. Predators know that children are anxious, they miss their friends, they are lonely. She says online predators also know that some families are struggling financially right now. A lot of games require upgrades and coins and that sort of thing, and if the economy being what it is and things are tight, that could be another tactic they use to send financial gifts and coins for upgrades. But she says that doesn't mean your kids have to be vulnerable. We as parents can do something about it. We can talk to our kids. We can let them know that if they bring something to us, our first action is going to be to take away their access. They're not going to surface something if they think they're going to lose their ability to play games or talk with their friends. Titania says the best way to talk to your kids about this is just to be direct. Let them know there are dangerous people out there, but you're always a resource for them if they need someone to talk to. Yeah, that's a conversation we've had to have with our kids. They're spending so much more time online because of digital learning. So what's the advice for that? Should they spend less time doing that? No, but she does want parents to monitor where their kids are spending time online. So if it's a game, make sure you take advantage of those free parental controls. If there's a chat function, make sure you know who your kids are talking to. But more than anything, just letting your kids know that they can talk to you. A real volunteer effort next to Metro Atlanta Business Group jumps in to help get face shields for healthcare workers. Your 11 Alive storm trackers watching those temperatures that were on the rise today made it into the low 80s and it looks like we could have some of the hottest temperatures we've had so far this year this coming weekend. We'll time all that out for you coming up. Coming up, Major League Soccer planning its return. You'll hear from one Atlanta United player about the risk involved outside of health. That's coming up in sports. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. With a continuing shortage of face masks and face shields for dedicated health care professionals, urgent calls went out for supplies. When the Paulding County Chamber of Commerce got the call, they acted very quickly. And as Bill Liss found out, the results have been overwhelming. Within hours of getting the call from the Wellstar Hospital in Paulding County that face shields were in short supply, the County Chamber of Commerce got right to work. The race was on to produce 3D face shields for the medical teams focusing on COVID-19. The first step was get a supply of 3D machines. The chamber got 22. The next step, get volunteers. We had approximately 40 volunteers. Uh, we trained those volunteers by a pay it forward routine. We had the process down so fine that uh, we actually had some uh, young adults and some children that were able to come in and, and work for us also. Volunteers worked in shifts around the clock at chamber headquarters to turn out the face shields, and they're still at it already turning out more than 3,200 face shields, and they have plans to keep up the effort. 2,500 of those will be distributed to Wellstar Paulding Hospital. We also have been um, asked to produce some for our local health department, some of our home health care agencies, as well as some other entities throughout our county. What brings it all together are the Paulding County volunteers. They are dedicated and they're determined. One of them is Gary Jones. We want to be able to make some of these safety shields 
for our healthcare workers so they can continue uh, their part in what they do. And that's, of course, helping other people uh, get well. And that's an awesome feeling. Jones has his own 3D machine at home, and he continues making the shields each night after he leaves the chamber workshop. The Paulding Chamber of Commerce says it looks forward to other counties asking them for help in setting up similar efforts for healthcare professionals. To cut costs, uh, Delta Airlines is saying goodbye to more than a dozen jets. It's the 770, uh, it, the 777. Uh, uh, there are 18 Boeing planes from the fleet. In a memo to employees, the company says it was a tough decision, but is necessary in order to protect finances, jobs, and the company's future. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, charges from the Boeing 777 are expected to reach up to $1.7 billion pre-tax in the second quarter. Well, we saw some clouds today. In fact, it started out pretty overcast and gray. I'm meteorologist Samantha Moore, one of your 11 Alive storm trackers. And Mary Beth Etheridge in Stockbridge captured these uh, pictures, a, a few pictures of some clouds, and put them on our 11 Alive storm tracker Facebook page. We'll likely see a cloudy start to tomorrow as well. So a 9 on the wasometer on that scale of 1 to an 11, with 11 being perfect. It is going to be a bit cloudy to start. They'll break up in the afternoon, though, and temperatures will still manage to be on the warm side in the low 80s. So if you going out for a mid-morning break tomorrow, it should be around the mid-60s at 10 o'clock with quite a few clouds around. By lunchtime, we should start to see them break up a little bit, 75 for a, a temperature to take your lunch outdoors. It should be really warm for that. And then getting into the low 80s, once again, unseasonably warm if you have to be working outside on your balcony. So we're looking at a very high a UV index tomorrow because the skies are going to be clearing in the afternoon. So a 10 on the, a 10 on your UV index means that you can burn in just 15 minutes. So be sure to check your check your um, protect your eyes protect your skin as well. So we have high pressure control. That's why we're going to be heating up and it's sending any storms that are trying to form up and over that ridge. We'll see a few clouds making its way through that ridge overnight though. So it will be a little cloudy to start. And then we're going to be watching that low that we were talking about that the National Hurricane Center expects to develop here the next uh, two days. 70% chance it'll develop. And if it does become a named storm, it'll be Arthur. And notice it's going to kind of move to the north. And these are two models. This is the GFS and the Euro on top of each other. And whenever you see these rings pretty close together, they're in agreement. So our confidence is high that this will likely be uh, in the direction it takes right up along the coastline. So that's going to whip up waves from Florida into the Carolinas and then move off to the east here. So we do think it will impact our coastline in terms of rip currents as well as some big waves. And, you know, we'll stay mostly dry the next few days. All the rain's going to be a associated out here with that uh, tropical or subtropical system. We're not sure if it's going to have completely tropical characteristics yet. But over the course of the weekend, we'll start to see that ridge break down and a little rain try to make its way in late Sunday and then a pretty good chance on Monday that it'll make it through here. It won't be a real soaker, but it will be a frontal system that will usher in some showers and thunderstorms and it'll bring in some cooler air for us as well as we head into Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. So as we get in towards the weekend, temperatures really ramping up. The hottest temps of the year will likely be on Sunday when we reach 89 degrees. We'll probably have some 90 degree readings in places like Columbus, maybe LaGrange. 20% chance of rain late in the day, 40% chance Monday into Tuesday morning, and then we dry it out and clear it out for some very nice weather Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, it's been 64 days since we have had a live sports event in Georgia, and still there are a few more days to wait. NASCAR, though, is ready to return to Georgia, announcing today three races on June 6th and 7th. As Alex Glaze tells us how Atlanta Motor Speedway now is ready to host a race once again. Atlanta Motor Speedway was ready to host a race in March when sports was suddenly shut down. We haven't done anything since we closed the doors in March. So a lot of what was prepared for the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500 weekend is still prepared. Now with the approval of the state, NASCAR has announced the green flag will fly again on June 6th and 7th. Hosting one of the first live sporting events and broadcasting it to the world uh, comes with a big responsibility. By excluding fans, Atlanta Motor Speedway Vice President Brandon Hutchison 
estimates well over 3,500 workers are at the track for a typical weekend. This year, he believes it will be less than 1,000. The sport has been closely looked at. We've whittled down the numbers as much as we can. But keeping all the essential personnel safe will require a lot of work. We'll take the next couple of weeks and analyze all of the areas that will be utilized and sanitize and clean before the event, during the event, and even after the event. And if all goes well, it could be the first step in opening Atlanta Motor Speedway back up for more events, perhaps even more races. Falcons virtual offseason continues, but that is starting to raise more questions for people like Dirk Cutter. And, and Cutter is the Falcons offensive coordinator, as you know. He admitted today he's not sure what new running back Todd Gurley's health is like. For the past few seasons, Gurley, you know this, battled knee injuries, reduced his workload. While Cutter knows Gurley's value, there's a lot of questions here. The main question is that, that no one seems to know is, you know, what's his, what's his health status, you know, and what, what's his workload. You know, we'll just see. But, I mean, you can't, you can't deny his, his talent and what he's already done in this league. The question is, is uh, his health. I, I don't have any inside information about Gurley, but I, I got to tell you, the bells, the sirens, the alarms go off in my head that, I don't know, I, I hope he's ready to go. I hope so. We'll see. Major League Soccer trying to figure out a plan to start the season, which may have the players quarantined in a place like Disney in Orlando. Alex Glaze is a busy man in this segment. He tells us what the players think about possibly having to play. Atlanta United is one of the teams that has returned to training as MLS reportedly eyes return to play in June. I think the idea of playing games seems very exciting. I think there's nothing more I want to do right now than run out and just resume my schedule as things are normal. MLS has reportedly proposed placing all 26 teams in Orlando this summer and playing games without fans at the Disney Sports Complex and possibly other sites. Players, coaches, and support staff would live under quarantine for an undetermined amount of time. To get everybody's mind right, body right, I think that plays a big part of the whole because it's one, it's just a physical sport, this one, it's one which, you know, demands a lot mentally and it is going to be hard to get away for a few months or so to get these games out of the way. So if that does come up, we just need to make sure we come up with solutions for us as players where, you know, they're looking after ourselves on the mental side as well. For some players, the potential of being away from family for an undetermined amount of time is a concern. If I go into a field, I want to give all I can. And if I'm going to give all I can, potentially for a month, two months, two or three weeks, wouldn't be enough for me. I think the risk is very, very high because, you know, there's a chance we could go out and get injured for the sake of two months of play and we can miss, you know, you know how some of these injuries are. The reported proposal has not been agreed upon, but has been sent to the union. Uh, we're hearing some sad news tonight. 88 year old Pepper Rogers has died. Uh, you know, one of Bobby Dodd's players on the national championship in 1952. I, I, I believe he played from 51 to 53 at Georgia Tech and then was head coach uh, after uh, after coach Dodd, uh, 74 to 79. But again, Pepper Rogers is dead at the age of 88. A lot of memories in Atlanta about Coach Rogers. All right, we'll take a break. Back right after this. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Some help for frontline workers in Douglas County. Medline Industries donated thousands of dollars of personal protective equipment to the county. The donation includes isolation gowns, which are very hard to get these days. The PPE will go to healthcare workers fighting to stop the spread of COVID-19. We want to thank you for watching tonight, and we appreciate it as always to have you here. Uh, again, uh, Pepper Rogers has died tonight at the age of 88. Okay? Played for Coach Dodd, backup quarterback, place kicker on the national championship team in, in 1952. He uh, graduated from Tech in 55 and was head coach from 74 to 79. Certainly a lot of memories of uh, Pepper Rogers. So I'll have more on my Facebook page coming up. Anyway, that's it. Have a good night. hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continue. The attorney for one of the suspects charged in the Ahmad Albury case faces the public for the first time. The next steps for the defense team and a health alert tonight about the mystery illness linked to COVID-19 in kids. The CDC's new guidance to help doctors spot the illness. On the rise, grocery prices spike in Atlanta when you can expect those prices to head on back down. From 11 Alive 